Good evening, everybody. Hey, hey. Uh, we're here today at our uh, Cloud GDG meetup. Uh, Kaz will be here. Uh, he's a developer advocate from Google, and we'll be talking about the uh, uh, By the way, who knows what GDG Cloud is? Awesome, at least half of the people. Uh, so we're a community focused in cloud service providers. Uh, Google also, Amazon, whatever you prefer. So if you have any talks, any interesting things, use cases that you want to present or talk about, or even talk about failures, which is great, uh, you can come to me or Shai in the back there. And uh, you can offer anything you'd like. We're doing meetups every month. Even we'll do more than once in a month if you'd like. Just approach, okay? And uh, I will give the stage to Kaz. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, how, how much time? Do I have? You're free. Oh, okay, okay. Maybe I can spend one hour. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. So thank you, uh, everybody, for attending my session. It's titled TensorFlow in the Wild. I'm Kaz Sato. I'm based in Tokyo. Uh, I joined the Google six years ago, and uh, for the last four years, I have been working in the Google Cloud team. Hello. <laughs> we have a yeah, we have a visitor. And uh, for the last two and a half years, I have been uh, working as a developer advocate. It's like an evangelist uh, for developers. So I usually uh, have a uh, public speaking event like this, uh, attending the uh, meetups and events uh, in EU or Japan, APAC or the America. And especially focusing on data and analytics, uh, like a data analytics products such as Google BigQuery or the machine learning products such as TensorFlow. So I'd like to start with the discussions the, between the all the buzzwords such as AI, machine learning, and neural network. AI, there's no um, definitive definition for the artificial intelligence, but you can say it's a science of making things smart, like. Um, designing an um, autonomous driving car or having a computer drawing a beautiful picture are those smarter things you can do with. And machine learning is uh, one way to realize those AI vision of AI, like having uh, machines to learn from the training, uh, the real world data sets or real world rules. And one way to implement the machine learning is neural networks, that is, um, just one type of the uh, many different algorithms in machine learning. In traditional machine learning, we have uh, many different algorithms such as the, uh, the logistic regressions, support vector machines, and random forest. And neural networks has been having a, a breakthrough uh, since at around 2012, uh, especially because we have the uh, lots of computing power with the GPUs and cloud, and also lots of the tons of the data set we can use for the neural network training. And Google has been focusing on uh, developing the neural network technologies for the last four or five years. What is the neural networks? How many people actually had tried neural networks or using neural networks? Or many people, right? 50%. Thank you for that. So let's recap. Neural networks, you can see it's, a, it's like a function in math or a function in a programming language. So you can have an input and you could have an output from neural networks. For example, if you want your neural networks to recognize an image of a cat, you can train the neural networks uh, so that yeah, you can convert all the uh, image of cat into a larger vector. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's a first for you, right? Image of a dog. Yeah, image of a dog. <laughs> and uh, you, can you can train the neural network model to uh, recognize an Im whether the image is an is a image of cat or dog. But the thing is that you can apply the technology to any kind of the applications. Uh, for example, if you have a, your own game server, gaming server, you can try converting all the uh, user activities from uh, coming from the uh, server logs, activity logs. You can really, uh, uh, in uh, what's it, converting the, all the activities into a single vector uh, and have the neural networks to recognize what player will be the, uh, the premium player who could be buying more and more items from, from your game server, what, who, what player could be a more, uh, what player could be a cheating player who is trying to cheat uh, on the cheating, doing a cheating on your server. 
So just this is just an example. The thing is, you can apply the technologies to any kind of the applications. And actually, the, what they are doing inside neural network is very simple math. It's just a bunch of the multiply and add between the vectors and matrices. So it's not a very sophisticated advanced mathematics. It's just a high school level mathematics. And let's take a look at the, how it works in, in with the live demonstrations called the double spiral program. In these demonstrations, I'll be using the, uh, the data set with two inputs, x1 and x2. And if you plot the data points with those two inputs, you can clearly see, see there are two different, different spirals, groups, orange spiral and blue spiral in the data set. And for humans, it's really easy to classify these data points. For example, if you have a new data point here, it must be an orange. If you have a new data point here, uh, apparently it's a blue group. But what kind of pro what kind of program code you would write to instruct computer to classify these data points? Uh, do you want to write many if statements with conditions and thresholds whether each data point is in this area or this area or this area? Maybe you can do that with writing the tens or hundreds of the if statements of conditions. But instead, you can use the machine learning, especially neural networks. Uh, to solve this particular problem. So this is a demonstration called uh, TensorFlow Playground where you can have the two inputs, x1 and x2, and you have the neural networks between the input and output, and at output there's a one neuron that can classify whether uh, the data points should be in the orange group or, or blue group. So let's start training the neural network model. So now it is training the model with the uh, training data set, uh, this spiral data set. So initially, the neural networks cannot make any sense on the data. So now it thinks the any data point in the, this area could be an orange, and any, any data points in this, this area should be in blue, so it doesn't work. But if you keep spending a lot of the, the uh, data, data sets, data points, training data, and uh, spending much computing power, then the gradually computer tries to find a hidden patterns or features from the training data set, as you're seeing right now. So now the network has been trained enough to classify whether the data put is in the blue or orange. So it's as smart as humans now. So, this is how neural network works. And uh, if you take a look at uh, what kind of things each neuron are doing, then you can find each neuron in the neural network is doing very simple task. For example, this particular neuron at the top left corner is just draw a straight line on the 2D space and crash by whether the data point is in the blue area or white area. This is so-called linear classification. It's a very simple classification. This neuron is doing the, the another very simple linear classification whether the data point is in the left or right. So it's very simple. But if you have many uh, neurons in a single layer, and if, by having the multiple layers in the neural networks, then you can have the, each neurons in the higher layers can be getting more and more smart. These neurons can recognize whether the data point is in this white area these neurons have another uh, weird patterns and uh, that can recognize these patterns. So you can see the neurons is getting smarter and smarter as you have more and more higher layers. The neurons at the third layer can recognize very complex patterns like this. And neurons at the, the final layer can recognize the double spiral patterns as humans do. So this is, this is how neural network works. And the most important thing here is that you don't have to program the neural networks to solve each problems. The traditional IT systems requires a human programmer who have to instruct to the computer how to solve each problem by specifying the, uh, the uh, exact steps to solve the problems. If you have this kind of data, you have to do this. If you have this data, you have to do this. But instead, what I have done with this demonstration it's just specify how many neurons are in each layer and how many layers you could have. 
like what kind of the activation function you could use. So that's it. I didn't do any programming with these neural networks at all. Instead, I had computers try to find how to solve this problem by itself. And that's the reason why the AlphaGo, AlphaGo is the uh, Go AI program that has beaten the world uh, top champion of the Go uh, recently. Uh, because the AlphaGo was able to have the millions of the virtual matches between the, the uh, AlphaGo <coughs> AIs and try to learn the, what's the hidden patterns inside the, all the Go matches. And without having instruction from the humans, AlphaGo was able to find the best way to play the Go to beat humans. So neural network can extract the hidden features from the data set without having instruction from humans. And by using this technology, you can even have computers to recognize this image as a cat. And to do that, you have to have the deeper neural networks. That is so-called deep learning or deep neural network. So in production at Google, we use a deep neural network model for image recognition, which has about like 50 to 80 uh, layers between input data and output data. It's much, much deeper. And by having that kind of deep neural networks, you can train the neural neurons in the each layers to recognize very simple patterns like these edges of objects, or the textures in an image, or a part of an object like an eyes of human face, or a, a wheel in a vehicle, or a whole object like a human face, or a cat, or flower or wedding party. So that's how you can use the neural networks to solve a problem. Okay. So this was a very basic, uh, very short introduction of neural networks and machine learning. Mm -hmm. And how Google has been using the technologies for implementing our services. And actually if we are using the most of the Google services, like the Google Search, Android Play, Gmail, you have been already using deep learning from Google every day. For example, Google Search has introduced RankBrain, which is a deep learning model, a deep learning based ranking algorithms in 2015. And RankBrain was the, the one of the most, uh, the, the provided the best uh, the, the outcome by using, by introducing deep learning for the Google Search team. Google Photos is another most successful uh, mobile applications by using the deep learning. So you don't have to put any tags or keyword or metadata on the, the photos you have taken with smartphones anymore. Instead, the deep neural network model can recognize the content of images, and you can just type the uh, keyword to search your photos like a dog or flowers, wedding party. Inbox and Gmail, those the email applications, now have the smart reply features so that you can as you can see at the bottom, you can have the, uh, the options to reply the each email thread. So for example, you can see at the bottom, like I just sent them to you or I'm working on it, things like that. So this is actually implemented by the neural network model that is applied to the natural language processing. So it is trying to understand the context of the each email thread. And now over 12% of the all responses sent on mobile applications, inbox, Gmail, are generated by those neural network models. So you can say now email are written by computers, uh, not by humans anymore. Google Translate recently introduced a new neural tra machine translation model. So that has improved the quality, especially the fluency of the translated text so much. So it's so fluent, so it's so confident on the, uh, the, uh, the, the uh, it's so confident on you making a translation on from the original text to the target text. <coughs> and beyond those uh, the services and products, we are seeing uh, more achievement on the research projects such as the WebNet, which is a voice synthesized uh, neural network developed by DeepMind team. I can show some demonstration of the uh, WebNet. This is um, designed for voice synthesize and uh, but what I'm so surprised to hear is that when they train the model with the music rather than human voice, so yeah, it's, yes, it's uh, the quality of the voice synthesize is so high. But I'm so surprised when I was listening to the music they had generated generated with the model.
that was the classical piano music, but that sound has never existed in the, in the real world. That was not a sampling or recording of existing sound. Instead, that sound you just heard has been generated by the neural networks bit by bit as a digital audio sample that's the uh, 16 kilohertz. And what they did with the WebNet model is the, uh, they have used the uh, convolution neural network model that is typically used for the recognizing the images. They have used the CNN for uh, training the model with the sound, uh, digital, digitalized sound. And again, I want to stress that this is not a sample audio. That means there's no copyright holder uh, for the sound you just heard. So it's high quality classical piano music, but there is no original player or there is no copyright holder. You can infinitely generate that kind of music by using by using neural networks. So that's and actually they are now um, building their new synthesizers, uh, the uh, audio synthesizers that is using based on these same technologies. And also the another application of the neural network is the uh, analysis on the medical images such as detecting the uh, diabetic, diabetic disease by looking at the, uh, the images of the bottom eyeballs. So by using deep learning, you can get the higher accuracy than the ordinary doctors right now. So maybe in the next uh, couple of years, maybe a few years, you'll be seeing more and more uh, medical use cases for deep learning in coming in the production. This is another uh, outstanding achievement by the deep, uh, deep mind team. Uh, they, was, they were able to apply the deep learning model to optimize the, the, cooling, resource, the cooling resource energy use, usage in the Google data center. So until now, they, we have been using human operation to optimize the cooling resource energy allocation in the Google data centers. But they were able to use the deep learning to automate all the resource allocations and so that they were able to reduce the 40% of the resource energy, energy consumption. And that ended up with the 15% uh, increase of the PUE or power effective use, uh, PUE, power usage effectiveness. So now at Google, we have over 100 production projects that have been using deep learning model, in addition to the traditional machine learning model. So we have been using the traditional machine learning model for a long time, many years, but now we have the Product, uh, projects with deep learning for, for over 100. And most of those, the uh, machine learning or AI-based services are now develop, developed with TensorFlow, which is the open source tool for building a neural network model for, me, for you. TensorFlow is the open source library for machine intelligence, especially focused on the deep learning and neural network model. And we have open sourced it in November uh, 2015. So anybody can go to tensorflow.org and tap, download the sample code and framework by yourself. And this is the latest framework we are using for de de developing any AI or machine learning based service in Google. And one benefit you could get with TensorFlow is the easy to develop. It's so easy to get started. So actually I myself is not a machine learning expert. I don't have any uh, the advanced mathematic background, but still as, uh, I can use the uh, machine learning by using TensorFlow. When I, I remember when I started to learn about the neural network by uh, textbooks, I was I felt so it's so hard because I there were so many uh, mathematics <coughs> equations on the textbook. And uh, until uh, like uh, four or five years ago, you have to understand all the equations, math equations on the uh, textbook, and you have to have a skill to implement your own optimization algorithms such as a gradient descent or back propagation, propagation by yourself. But now you don't have to do that. Instead, you can just download TensorFlow and try the, the sample code, and that's it. So you can just write a, a tens of lines of Python code to define what kind of the algorithms you want to run with TensorFlow, like a gradient descent optimizer. So you don't have to build your own, write your own optimizing algorithms by yourself. It's so easy. And also, the TensorFlow is designed to be portable and scalable. So you can just download the TensorFlow on your <coughs> Mac or Windows to get started with the sample code. But you may find 
uh, that yeah, if you want to train your neural network model to classify image of a cat or image of a dog, uh, your Mac or Windows is not enough. The CPU is too slow to train your neural network model. So you may want to go uh, the electronics shop and uh, buy a GPU card. So GPU server, GPU card usually uh, provides uh, 10 times uh, to 50, 50 times faster performance of training neural network. So that's the reason why everybody serious about the deep learning are using GPU servers, but single GPU server is not enough. So many people, serious people like, like Google or Microsoft, Facebook, they are all using tens or hundreds of GPU servers running in power. <coughs> so that is so-called distributed training. So, but GPU cluster requires very high speed networks, like InfiniBand, RDMA, so it's so, uh, it costs so much. Uh, so, instead of building your own GPU cluster by yourself, many people uh, want to use the, uh, the GPU clusters for running on cloud. That's uh, faster and easier. So TensorFlow is designed to support those uh, scalable uh, infrastructure in the cloud. So you don't have to think about anything about building a GPU cluster by yourself. Instead, you can just define your own TensorFlow graph and upload it to the cloud and uh, using the like a 10 GPUs or 50 GPUs running on the cloud to train your neural network model. So it's so scalable. And once you have finished your, your training of your, your, your neural network model, you can download the uh, neural network model to uh, smaller systems like Android or iOS or Raspberry Pi. So you can have the smartphones recognizing some objects in your images, or you can have Raspberry Pi uh, detecting some uh, the uh, failures of the IoT uh, sensors or the, some machineries on your factories. TensorFlow also provides the, uh, the debugger tools and visualization, visualization tools such as TensorFlow, so it's so easy to take a look at the, and do analysis on the dataset you have. And now we have the TensorFlow 1.0 released in the last February. Uh, that allows you to use the much higher level of the APIs. So the, I'll be showing the real, real demonstration of the high level APIs in TensorFlow is, uh, after this, but it's so easy to get started uh, rather than using the ordinary low level API of the TensorFlow. And now TensorFlow, uh, the API is stable and uh, it is fixed, so it's production ready. There will be no uh, breaking change, uh, breaking change anymore. And if you have uh, any experience on trying out the, the popular machine learning frameworks such as Keras, now Keras is, is uh, one of the standard APIs supported on TensorFlow. So you can just use your existing Tensor, uh, Keras model uh, and running with the TensorFlow 1.0 or 1.1. And we also provide a new API called Estimator that allows you to write a few lines of Python code. I'll be showing the demonstrations. So let me show the actual demonstration. So this is here a demonstration called Crash by Manhattan with BigQuery and TensorFlow. This is a demonstration for training a very simple neural network model that can crash by weather and location with latitude and longitude. It's in Manhattan or outside Manhattan. It's a very simple uh, demonstration. And this tool, this demonstration is running on a cloud data lab, which is an um, a tool from the Google Cloud that is that provides the uh, Jupyter Notebook integrated with the Google Cloud. So that means uh, Jupyter Notebook is uh, the, one of the most popular uh, tools for the data scientists where you can use the browser to run your Python code running inside the browser to do the data analytics in that. And by using Data Lab, you can also execute the, the BigQuery SQL inside browser and copy all the result data uh, imported into the Python runtime, so that you can easily do the uh, access the data data warehouse as well as the uh, all the toolkits such as TensorFlow or Scikit-Learn uh, or NumPy by using Python. So let's uh, take a look, take a look at how it works with BigQuery. So now I'm running the SQL query on BigQuery to extract the uh, training data set from BigQuery. <coughs> In these demonstrations, I'd like to use the uh, training dataset called NYPD Collisions. That is a 
um, sample of public data sets that has the, all the, uh, the data for the accidents happening in the uh, New York City. Right. It's not working well. Let me do the system. Why Not sure. That's it. Loses the connection. How many people have used the uh, Jupyter notebook or Atlas? When you use the Jupyter notebook or IPython notebook, usually you have to do the, uh, everything from the pre-processing and do the analytics with the Jupyter notebooks. But as long as you are using cloud data lab, you can do everything inside data lab, like uh, the uh, loading the data from the uh, BigQuery and do analytics ad hoc analysis only on the data lab. So everything is encapsulated in a single environment. And also, you can have the access to the uh, GPU cluster or the, or the Google Cloud from data lab too. So let me execute the query again. I think it's working now. So this is the training data set <coughs> where you have the timestamp and borrow and latitude and longitude of each accident, car accident happened in the New York City. And let's use this as a training data set for training our neural network model. <coughs> but uh, you have to do some pre-processing against this data set because you can find there are some useless rows, such as this row. This row doesn't have any borrow, so you cannot tell whether the latitude and longitude is inside Manhattan or not. So by changing the SQL a little bit, we can do this some um, uh, pre-processing against the data set. So you are excluding the old rows that doesn't have any latitude or longitude. And also I have added a new flag called is empty that tells whether the, the data uh, the location is in Manhattan or not. And I have I'm shuffling the data and uh, reading the first ten thousand rows. So I'm defining the uh, SQL and this is where you can execute the BigQuery query from Python and to load the result into the Python as a NumPy array. So now I'm executing a query from Python so that the result will be converted to a NumPy array. NumPy is the another very popular uh, library, open source library for uh, numerical operations or data analytics. So for data scientists, everybody is using NumPy for handling these arrays. And now you got the uh, training data set. The, uh, all the 10,000 rows of the pairs of the ratchet and longitude, and whether each data, uh, uh, whether it, whether uh, each geolocation is in Manhattan or not. So this is the training data set. Let's take a look at how it looks like. So this is the, how the training data set looks like. As you can see, uh, you can see the shape of the Manhattan, and you can even see the shape of the uh, Central Park here. So we'll be using the, this training data set to train the neural network model. And before that, we have to split the data into training data and test data. And this is where you can define a TensorFlow neural network. You have to import the TensorFlow library, and you have to specify DNN classifier. DNN stands for, for the deep neural network classifier. So that's it. And uh, before having the TensorFlow 1.0, uh, you have you had to write like a tens of lines of Python code to define deep neural networks. For example, if you have a neural network with uh, five hidden layers, you have to write uh, like a 50 lines of Python code. It's so tedious. But now you can just use the single line of Python code to define a deep neural networks. This is how you can use the, the high-level API of TensorFlow. And this defines a uh, four hidden layers with <coughs> 20 uh, new ones in each layer. So, running it. So you have the neural network. 
And before starting training these neural networks, I'd like to show how stupid it is before training by visualizing the uh, new classification result. So you use this the uh, hot leaks for visualizing. So this is the result you got without training. Neural network thinks these blue areas are the uh, Manhattan because it's mm. not trained yet. So I'm starting training the neural network by using the uh, training data set downloaded from BigQuery. Mm -hmm. okay, so where is this running right now? Is this on your desktop? Or? Ah, this Cloud Data Lab is, uh, uses the Google Compute Engine, the virtual machine uh, instance running on Google Cloud. So it's running on Cloud right now. So now you are seeing gradually neural network is trying to get a better result. It's getting much smarter and smarter. And this is the final result. So what is this step? What's that? It says after 100 steps, what is a step? Yeah, it's the how many numbers you're calling the, uh, what is the call? The feet. So the uh, DNN <coughs> crash file object has a fit method that trains the neural network model. So the number of steps means how many times you are training the model based uh, with the training data set. Excuse me? How does it know that it's an island? What's that? How does it know that it's an island? It could be that you're missing some pieces, the no crashes at the edge, you know, in Battery Park or other places, you know what I'm saying? Using just the coordinates. I mean, how does it know where it ends? Ah, sorry. Those are the data points, the very data. Of the, of the map or the crash points? The crash points. The crash points. So there's no map data at all. I'm the not using point. it. So there's no crash at the edge of Manhattan? Yeah, so this is based on the, the access. So if you have a place where uh, no the crash happens, then uh, it's really the model is not trained. Uh, Actually, so you can see some accidents outside of my hat that are classified as potential. Yeah, so this is uh, some uh, of the uh, locations the uh, neural networks have, have uh, made mistakes. So, usually, if you, 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 if you are training a machine learning model, it's almost impossible to have a 100% accuracy. So, that's the limitation of the machine learning. But still, it has the uh, not accuracy, like a 99%, 99.75%. So it's totally depending on the how you can apply the technologies to your application so program. So this is a very simple uh, demonstration of how you can use the uh, TensorFlow machine learning model combined with the <coughs> query data warehouse. And it shows how it, easy, it is easy to get started. back to the slide. And another benefit you could get with TensorFlow is the community and ecosystem. And now if you go to the GitHub and if you compare the number of the GitHub stars uh, between those frameworks for deep learning and neural networks, you can see the TensorFlow is the most popular framework. Mm -hmm. I think the graph is not really <coughs> Yeah, actually the number of the GitHub stars is uh, TensorFlow is the most uh, highest number of the stars. It's not reading well. So let me go with without the presentation mode. So as you can see, it's uh, much, much higher. That means you can have the uh, much bigger community and ecosystem and partners in the uh, industry. So for example, if you go to Japan, so we have the uh, once or twice of the TensorFlow user group meetups every month at Google Office. And every time we have like 300 registrations for meetups, and we have twice of them in a month. So it's the most active community in the machine learning area. And also we have many serious companies such as Airbus, Arm, or Dropbox, Intel, Twitter, they are all using TensorFlow for their use cases. For example, Qualcomm 
recently made an announcement of supporting TensorFlow with the Snapdragon chipset. Snapdragon is one of the most popular chipset in the, uh, the Android devices, smartphones. And they announced to support TensorFlow directly by their DSP or digital signal processor. Digital signal processor is the core processors running <coughs> studious CPU. So it's not a CPU or GPU. It's a, uh, originally designed to run the, uh, the voice processing or the signal processing required for the, uh, the encryption or the uh, image processing. But now you can get you can use the DSP for running your neural network inference or predictions. So I can show you the demonstration. And if you want to run the neural network prediction or inference, uh, by inference I mean you, uh, the time when you are using the neural networks for recognizing an object and images, or things like that, then usually you have to run your CPUs, especially if it's a smartphone, so you have to use the ARM processor. It's a not strong or a uh, powerful processor. But still the inference or predictions with neural networks takes so much computing power. So that's the reason why it takes sec two, two seconds to recognize a t this teddy bear by using CPUs. It takes about two seconds. It's too slow. And also, you have to uh, consume much battery power when you're running the neural network model. Mm, I think the thing is stuck. My connection is going to be no. You're connected to which Wi-Fi? The guest? Mm -hmm. No, it's uh, connected to the corporate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there is a speaker. Oh. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But if, if you take a look at the uh, right side, the DSP is running the TensorFlow model so that you can get the much, much shorter, like 120 milliseconds. It's like 15 times faster. Than CPU and it consumes no CPU cycles. Mm -hmm. So if you are really serious about bringing the deep learning technologies into mobile phones or smartphones or embedded systems, you really have to get the acceleration support from hardware. Mm -hmm. And again, that is, that is uh, one benefit you could get with the ecosystem of TensorFlow. So. By getting those benefits from the TensorFlow, uh, there's a very interesting thing is happening right now, which is called democratization of machine learning. Question? Are you using the TensorFlow Lite or the... Ah, good question. The, at Google I.O., uh, we have announced a new thing called TensorFlow Lite. Uh, actually, that demonstration was not running on TensorFlow Lite, because TensorFlow Lite, we are <coughs> actually writing it right now. <laughs> it's not ready yet. Now that demonstration was uh, directly written on the HBX uh, architecture running on the Snapdragon chipset. So it's a very, uh, very early demonstration. Yeah. And TensorFlow right, will be coming in the uh, near future as an office yes. yeah. So by democratization, I mean that you don't have to be a data scientist or machine learning expert to get started with the technology. And uh, like these Japanese cucumber farmers, and I went to their cucumber farm and took these photographs by myself. And they are the uh, cucumber farmers, and they have some who had started helping the cucumber farming two years ago. And what he found is that it takes so long time for farmers to sort in the cucumbers based on its shapes and colors and lengths. And his mother spent eight hours a day for sorting all the cucumbers uh, into nine different classes. And instead of, of helping her, he downloaded the TensorFlow <laughs> and built his cucumber sorter. Let me show the... Uh... Actually, he was a embedded system designer uh, before starting the cucumber farming. Uh, but uh, he didn't have any expertise on machine learning or deep learning. So that was the first time for him to try out the deep learning, but it is also easy to get started, so he was able to build these systems within six months, spending $15 uh, by using Arduino and Raspberry Pi. <laughs> Actually, 
actually I tried to look for this information when I first saw this story. Do you know how many cucumber pictures he used to train this? Uh, ah, a good question. He had to take a nine size, nine thousand, nine thousand uh, pictures of cucumbers. But at that time, he didn't know the techniques like the transport learning. So that's the reason why he had to take that much pictures. So there's a technique called transport learning that reduces the number of the data sets significantly. So I suppose by applying a transport learning, you can reduce the number into like 900 for each gigabyte or something like that. Another interesting demonstration is the uh, spin nugget server. This is a demonstration made by the, uh, the startup who are focusing on building the robot arm. And they are not experts of the machine learning or deep learning. But uh, they had an intern student who was so interested in the TensorFlow. So he downloaded the TensorFlow. And again, he took a picture of the hundreds of chicken <coughs> nuggets by himself and trained the TensorFlow model to locate the position of the, the uh, chicken nuggets on the plate. Uh, but it's not working. So the robot arm has a camera on top of it and it can recognize the position of the chicken nugget. Submit for the plate. And again, this is not a um, demonstration made by the professionals. This is made by this intern student. So all you have to do is hire an intern student <laughs> <laughs> and then let him for a while playing this tensorflow with that thing. <coughs> this is another very interesting use case of the neural networks. These girls are all virtual girls. There's no existing real girls in these pictures. What he have done is using DCGAN or GAN. It's a, it is a generative advanced serial, serial network. This is a type of neural networks where you can generate a new image or new content based on the training data set. So what he has, has done with this demonstration is that he collected tens of thousands of girl images, uh, TV posters in Japan, and trained a neural network. But the G GAN can generate a unique images that does not exist in any uh, training data set. So any single faces in these pictures does not exist in the 10,000 to be training data set. That means it can extract all the features of the TV box to girls, but it's a unique and copyright-free images. So you can generate this kind of high-quality content without having any copyright holders or copyright piece. And it, this is uh, just an application of the technology. So you can apply the technologies to generate any kind of high-quality context of images with your own training data set. And there are many, so, so many uh, interesting use cases of TensorFlow, like the uh, uh, designing uh, garbage can, that can crash by the uh, garbage is based on the uh, images, whether it's uh, recyclable or not, and many other interesting use cases. But if you, have, if you want to bring the technology into enterprise or production use cases, the largest challenge is be, will be the computing power. So it takes a few days or a few weeks to finish training so if you are really uh, serious about the building a large scale deployment or the technology. So that's the reason why we have been using the, the computing resource on Google Cloud for the large scale distributed training and prediction. In the single data center of Google Cloud, we have our over tens of thousands of machines and many of those servers are equipped, equipped with the latest GPUs. And also, the most important part of our Google Cloud is network. That is called Jupyter Network. And we are not using the commodity routers and switches from the uh, Juniper or Cisco routers. Instead, we have been designing our own network switches, uh, scratch from the hardware. And the Jupyter Network can hold over 100,000 of 10 gigabit Ethernet port that can yield 1.2 petabit per second. And uh, this is why we have been investing significantly on building our network, <coughs> is to consolidate all the server resources like uh, memories or CPU cycles or GPUs or the IOs, consolidated with the microsecond latency. It's just like uh, building a supercomputer for data processing or deep learning. And we even 
design our own LSI or ASICs called TPU, it's a second generation a tensor processing unit. This is not a CPU or GPU, this is um, specifically designed and customized chipset LSI designed by our, our hardware designers. The, that throughput like at 11.5 petaflops per pod uh, is almost identical, similar to the uh, supercomputer performance. So we are building the supercomputer just for running a neural network training and prediction. And what's the end result? For example, if you can access the 50 GPUs running on Google Cloud uh, with the hardware acceleration and the network, and then you can have the uh, 40 times faster training times for training your your uh, ImageNet model. Well, you can you could even have the higher uh, acceleration, such as 300 times faster training time. So that means while people are waiting for a few days or a few weeks for training their models, engineers in Google uh, can only spend like a tens of minutes, like a large time hours. Uh, to finish their trainings. So that's the largest difference between Google and the, every other uh, developers of deep learning. And that's the largest reason why Google has been so successful on deploying the uh, deep learning technology in production. So it's not only about the uh, data scientist or machine learning, but it's also about the uh, cloud technology and network technology and hardware acceleration you could get with the cloud. <coughs> And now we are externalizing the technology and the environment. Oh, question. One small question, please. The one petabit per second mm. channel you're using, is it used for the whole data center? That's the standard speed? Or? It's a whole data center. It's so called bisectional bandwidth. It's a data crossing, a crossing the whole data so center. So every P2P link is one beta per second? Oh, no, 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 uh, it's not like that. So it's a so-called bisectional bandwidth that measures the, uh, if you split the whole data center into two, yeah. that uh, between those two split Section. sections, uh, you can see the 1.2 petabit per second. Yeah. Can you say uh, how many number of hops between port and port you that? How many hops? Hops? Uh, yeah, I, I cannot tell the exact number. Sorry about that. But, uh, you can actually browse the paper with the GPU, it's public, so you can take a look at GPU. If one wants to get um, a bigger allocation of processing mm -hmm. for training, uh, how, how is that can be done? Yeah, actually the GPU is just available as an alpha, uh, so it's not public yet. But when it's available as an as a beta or the uh, GA, it should be available as the, uh, the uh, another type of instance of Google Cloud's or Google competency. So you can just you know specify any number of the instances or type of the instances. Free for use or? Uh, ah, it's a totally depending. Ah, uh, it's uh, commercial services. Okay. <coughs> so now the uh, we are externalizing the uh, infrastructure and the resources as a commercial product. Called ML engine or machine learning engine. But this is a um, fully managed to distribute the training and prediction environment running on cloud. And you, all you have to do is define your TensorFlow neural network graph and upload the TensorFlow graph onto cloud with your training data, and that's it. So many people have been struggling to build their own TensorFlow training environment by using Kubernetes or distributed training, but you don't have to do that. You can just use the ML engine, and that's it. And one of the, the challenges uh, of using deep learning is the hyperparameter tuning. Hyperparameter means the uh, things like the how many layers of the neural networks or how many uh, neurons in each layer or what kind of the activation function. And uh, those should be usually handled by the uh, many uh, techniques such as the random search or grid search. Uh, by grid search, you have to, I mean that you have to try all the possible combination of the uh, different combination of hyperparameters. But we provide hypertune that automate that kind of the hyperparameter tuning by a smarter algorithms such as the Gaussian process. So we also uh, provide the hyperparameter tuning automations by using the uh, ML engine. And lastly, I'd like to show some other interesting use cases of the ML engine by the uh, many uh, enterprises such mm -hmm. as Airbus or AXA. 
for the many Japanese customers. QP is one of the major food manufacturers in Japan, and they had to fi find the bad potato cubes were coming on the uh, belt conveyors. And they have been spending hundreds of thousands of dollars to build a specific, special the visual uh, analytic systems, but it didn't work. So. Mm -hmm. And instead, they have tried the TensorFlow and ML Engine to build their own um, bad potato detector. Sounds like Super Mario. What is that? <laughs> this that sounds uh, tells you a position of the bat uh, potatoes coming on the belt conveyors. So until now, they had to have the, all the workers uh, on the belt conveyors, uh, all the uh, workers in the factories, uh, intensely watching on the uh, all the cubes on the belt conveyors. It's a hard work. But now, instead of doing that, you can have the workers listen to this the Super Mario Rex sound and. But only when he or she hears that rings the of the bell, you can pick the uh, bad potatoes from the belt conveyors. So it's more lightweight work. AXA is one of the largest insurance company in the world, uh, based in France, and they have been trying to use machine learning to find the uh, large loss car accidents. Large loss means that is that uh, it's a large car accident where you have to pay over one ten thousand dollars as a uh, insurance payment, and they have been trying in many uh, traditional machine learning technologies, but uh, it, it didn't work well. So instead, they have tried the neural network model running on TensorFlow, and uh, they were able to get the, the seventy percent, seventy eight percent accuracy by using deep learning. And what they have done with this model is they have put all the 70 different input features that has the, all the attributes of the driver, such as the location of the driver, or what kind of the car they are driving, or the, what's the past uh, accident history of the drivers. And they are putting everything into the neural networks, and they got the, uh, the prediction result whether the driver could cause a large accident or not. Uh, all the inputs are categorical. It looks like all the inputs are categorical, right? Yes, yes, most of the, I'm not sure, the, I remember that the most of the, them are categorical, but I'm not sure uh, they have the also the linear values or not. Yeah. I don't know the every attribute, safety attributes. Oh, because there's, there's age, and a car value, and stuff. Yeah, I suppose the, most of them are categorical. And this is a very simple multi-layer uh, perceptron. This is not a very special model that they are using. <coughs> Another use case is real-time car auction. So Auknet is the one of the largest real-time car uh, used car auctions in Japan. They are handling the five million cars in a year. But for each car you want to enter on the auction, so you have to take uh, 20 different images from the different angles or different parts of the car and classify them by hand by putting the labels. And so it's tedious for them, so instead they have used the uh, deep learning model to build um, customized systems for uh, let's get down customized model for uh, classifying the used cars. So if you take uh, pictures of the used cars, you can upload those pictures to the system without having any uh, tags or metadata on it. You can just drop them all to the service. Mm -hmm. So that the uh, TensorFlow model running on ML engine is now providing the uh, prediction on each images. Mm -hmm. So that it can, the system can put the tags on it, whether it, the picture is on the uh, picture is a uh, the image of wheel or image of the uh, panel, image of the rear view or side view, things like that, and eventually you would get the result. And this system is already in production since last December, so just like the the Cucumber performance, the the planning is now being in, a, it's in production. 
So the system thinks that the image is for Toyota Land Cruiser Prado. And you, you don't have to specify any metadata like the side view or front view or tire. These are all classified by the new one for model. And you can also uh, tell the trivial, uh, the very small subtle difference between the front seat and the rear seat. So that is the technology we provide. So at Google, we provide many different toolkits based on the tensor properties in the open source tool. We provide the ML engine, which provides the fully managed uh, distributed training and predictions. And also, we provide the many uh, machine learning APIs that provides the pre-trained model for uh, image analytics through speech recognition or translation. So that's it. Thank you so much. Questions? In your model of the data life cycle, data life cycle. So I am uploading my car photos to this company's cloud, right? Now, where are the photos now? Who owns? The, are they on the Google servers now, or is there a, a, some kind of a buffer there where they do the first kind of few layers from TensorFlow and then they send you the data? How 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 will you manage it? Yeah, uh, there are many patterns. For example, uh, if you just download TensorFlow and use it on your on-premise devices, uh, like uh, your local data center, or even on the AWS, in that case, Google owns anything. And even if you're using Google Cloud for running your TensorFlow model, again, Google don't, doesn't own anything. So we can just provide the uh, cloud service, like a storage service or computation service. But TensorFlow is just an open source tool with the Apache 2 license. So Google doesn't own any IP or rights against your data. And uh, when you are using the ML API, such as Vision API uh, or the Speech API, again, uh, Google will just uh, takes your data for doing a recogni uh, image recognition or voice recognition, and we don't store any data uh, on our storage, and we don't use any data. Is there, a, is there any shared uh, data set, like, let's say, I'm thinking about what you just said, let's say that I'm a car, I'm a car dealer at uh, Japan, and there's another car dealer mm -hmm. at uh, the US, and uh, both of them, most chances are that which one so pretty much the same problem, so why not use the same data yeah, actually to, make, to, to make it bad to, to enough for mankind, basically. Yeah, that's difficult. a great point, and uh, actually that's the uh, the idea of the uh, this company is working on, so they are trying to reuse the same model to solve a different problems, just like the uh, transfer running I mentioned. Mm -hmm. So once you have trained your own model from scratch, that model could be applied to any kind of the different applications. And so is there, is there any like raw data that can be saved, you know, like if you take a picture with a digital camera, you have raw data that you can either use in other cases, like save for JPEG, save for PNG, so is there any raw data that can be used? Yeah, yeah. Especially uh, if you try to train the uh, image recognition model from scratch, usually it takes so long time. Uh, if you're using GPU, it takes like a few days and you have to spend like tens of thousands of your pictures to train the model. That's so much task. But we provide you uh, many uh, pre-trained models, like an Inception model or a VGG60 model. And so you don't have to train the model from scratch. Instead, you can use the transfer running. That means yeah, you can retrain the model uh, only for the last part of the neural networks uh, to solve your own problem. For example, if you have uh, any uh, product you have like a, a Coca-Cola can you want to recognize, then you can train the model, the only last layer of the neural networks to recognize the uh, Coca-Cola can for you. So that takes on a much, much fewer uh, training data set and computation power. So that's how you can uh, reuse the existing data set for any kind of the different use cases. And I expect that in coming one or two years, there will be more and more uh, vendors who will be, be using or licensing that kind of training, pre-training model to solve out each problem in a different applications. Okay. 
So, uh, one of the common programming languages used in Google is uh, Golang. Oh, so, yes. Uh, and I saw that uh, TensorFlow has a Golang API. And I wanted to ask is, to what extent is Golang used with TensorFlow inside Google? And what are the use cases? As if, are you using Python with Golang or only Golang? That's my question. Yeah, actually, Golang is uh, not a major language we use in Google. So, because Google is a large company with history, so we have large uh, legacy codes. Uh, most of them are written in C++, actually, and Python and Java, and then Go. So, Go is still a very small part of the whole code set we have. But, uh, yeah, you can use Go uh, for using uh, the TensorFlow, but uh, I would recommend, if you don't have any preference, the Python would be the best platform right now. So, so you're not using Golang today in production with TensorFlow <coughs> most of the time? Yeah, yeah, it depends on the teams uh, inside Google. Right? There's uh, some new teams who are using, who are right using Go for implementing everything. That kind of teams would need to use Go for uh, any uh, TensorFlow us usage. But uh, if you don't have any preference, maybe Python would be the uh, language you would get the, the much more resources like a documentation or so on. Uh, about the, the search ranking, about search ranking using the uh, deep learning. So I, I suppose if you pick a website, you don't really know the relevance of the, the website. So how do you, like, it's like you try to target something that you don't really know if it's relevant or not. How did you train? Yeah, actually, I'm not uh, uh, allowed to talk much more about the uh, Rakure algorithms. So, yeah. Uh, but it uses deep learning as a one signal uh, out of the uh, hundreds of the signals. We are using the hundreds of the signals for deep learning or ranking. And the Rakure deep learning model is just one signal of them. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.